Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the modem that we're building. Um, so this modem is uh, a low-cost uh, modem. Um, and essentially what we're trying to do is uh, um, create this similar or same technology that they have in, um, in terrestrial networks for underwater networks. And so there was a revolution, say, uh, 10, 15 years ago on building low-cost uh, cheap radios uh, that we hook sensors up to. Um, and this revolution hasn't quite hit the underwater domain, and I'll talk a little bit about why that's not the case. Um, so monitoring underwater is, is, is quite difficult. Um, there's a lot of things that you have to deal with in the underwater community that you don't have to do uh, in the terrestrial community, mainly waterproofing uh, and accessibility as well. Um, it's not easy and it's not cheap uh, to deploy sensors underwater. Uh, it requires... Um, boats and divers and uh, things like that. Um, so we've looked at uh, a few scenarios um, in detail, um, and these are kind of the scenarios that um, are typical of underwater networking. So the largest one is uh, using moorings um, and using a variety of different moorings. Um, these can be shallow water moorings that are close to the coast. Uh, there's many of these in coastal California, uh, up and down the west coast, and all around the world. Um, these have a different number of depths, and essentially what they do is they have a large buoy at the top that's anchored uh, to the bottom, and then they have a number of different sensors going up and down the mooring line. Um, these sensors can be anything from temperature sensors, which they typically have uh, on the order of every couple of meters or so, uh, which are the relatively low cost order of a couple uh, hundreds of dollars, um, to more expensive sensors like acoustic Doppler current profilers, which measure um, at very fine resolutions uh, the currents that are going uh, underneath the, the mooring. And then also different types of sensors, chemical sensors, optical sensors that measure different types of properties uh, of the ocean. Um, so these are um, typically six to year month deployments. Um, they're extremely costly. They require large boats, a lot of which actually come out of scripts um, for the Southern California area. Big A-frames to drop these moorings. It's a very delicate and uh, uh, difficult operation uh, that requires uh, very experienced people. Uh, another scenario that we've looked at um, is um, closer coastal monitoring, um, specifically for coral reefs. Um, the island I'm showing you there is an island uh, in French Polynesia uh, called Morea. It's about 15 kilometers on northwest of Tahiti. Uh, it's a rather small island, about uh, 60 kilometers um, in perimeter. Uh, it's a beautiful island. I had the opportunity to uh, to visit there. In fact, I was visiting there at the same time as uh, Larry Smarr and Doug uh, Palmer were there. Um, uh, they do a lot of sensing around this island, which I'll talk more about, um, but it's a lot different in terms of the mooring because it's a lot more shallow um, and it's a little bit more easily accessible. Uh, another project that we've just started um, that actually just uh, received some uh, NSF funding um, is looking at uh, drifters. So these are uh, floats. Uh, they can control their depth, but they are at the will of the currents in order to move around. Um, and so uh, collaborator Jules Jaffe, uh, working down at Scripps, is building these drifters. Um, they've started off rather large. Um, they have a uh, generation that's been deployed in, uh, that's about this size, and they have prototypes that are about this large right now. And the thing that they're really excited about here is, is the ability to get Lagrangian data. So that means that they can, uh, we can put a bunch of different sensors on these uh, drifters, and they drift with the currents. And there's a lot of scientific uh, questions that you can answer when you're actually drifting with the currents. Um, you know, how, how do plankton move, um, uh, things like that. Uh, another project that's seen uh, a lot of attention, uh, especially in the, past, in the events of the past uh, summer, is oil field monitoring. Um, so um, there's been a rather large amount of money coming from uh, oil companies, um, mainly to do seismic sensors, and these tell you things about um, how the drilling is going. Um, there is a, a project out of USC uh, headed by John Heidemann that uh, looks at oil film monitoring, and I mention this project mainly because they tried to build a low-cost modem and uh, never really got past the prototype stage. Uh, so I've talked a lot, and I don't have much time left, so let me quickly talk about Morea. Um, this is a typical deployment, many different sites. Um, there's about uh, 100 sensors uh, that are deployed uh, on 3- to 12-month intervals. 
These are different types of sensors. Some are thermistors. Uh, some measure tide, wave pressure, ADCPs measure um, uh, currents, CTDs, conductivity, temperature, depth. They can uh, use those in, in concert to measure salinity. And an Doppler, uh, uh, acoustic Doppler profiler is, is essentially ma measuring depth or currents. Um, the way that they deploy these sensors is something they jokingly call flip it, flipper net. Um, so they take these sensors out on boats, they take scuba divers down, they deploy them, they come back about a year later, and then they offload the data. So anything that they can do in order to uh, do real-time sampling uh, would help them tremendously. And a very simple thing that um, they would like to have is, is the sensor still working? Is it still functioning? Um, there are many horror stories, uh, mainly from graduate students that are working with the scientists there, that they deploy certain instruments, um, and then they wait 6 to 9 to 12 months, and they um, go down, retrieve the, the instruments, and, and realize that they stopped working uh, a few days after they were actually deployed. Um, so if we can just occasionally say, hey, are you working? Are you awake? That would be a, a huge advance, which seems relatively trivial. Um, being able to do some sort of event sampling, adaptive sampling, um, where there's something exciting happening. So the state of the art right now is they say, we have this much energy in our batteries. We know that one sample takes approximately this many joules. We do the math, and we can sample uh, once every minute or once every second, depending on what the type of sensor is. But what would be a lot more interesting is, for instance, when it rains, they get very excited when there's bad weather. A lot of things, there's a lot of mixing occurring. So if it's raining and we have some MET station saying, hey, it's raining or there's some turbulent weather, uh, you should sample a lot right now. Um, get a lot of data about this. Or there's something interesting. Another sensor picks up something interesting that's going on. Tell the sensors around it to start sampling a lot more to possibly see what's going on. Um, the scientists are extremely excited about this. Um, so the key here is a modem. Um, I'm just going to show this briefly. The, the whole point of here is the modems, current modems, are extremely expensive. Uh, so on the order of uh, five to $10,000. And what our goal of this project is to get down to, uh, you know, an order of magnitude cheaper. Um, and also have this open so it's more of a research platform that other people can use. A lot of people are very interested in doing experiments and understanding, doing real deployments, but it's very difficult because uh, they don't have this kind of money. And if they do have this mon kind of money to buy these modems, these modems don't offer them the ability to get into the physical layer, to change the modulation, things like that. The key thing about building a, a cheap modem is the transducer. Uh, when I started this project uh, six or seven years ago, we bought a custom transducer. Uh, this cost us something on the order of uh, uh, $5,000. So obviously we need to bring that cost down. So what we decided to do is we look for um, things, ceramics. Um, these are piezoelectric elements that um, uh, change their shape based on uh, a sound, acoustic wave. Uh, and this uh, ch uh, change in shape causes an electric potential across them, and vice versa. You can put an electric potential across them and, and create um, um, uh, a sound wave. So essentially, they're microphones and speakers all in one. Um, these are available. Um, we tested about 20 of these different things in water to see if we can find a cheap one. We were looking for, for things under, tw under $20 and found one uh, that works. So it's a $10 piezoelectric ceramic ring that I, sh I showed you right there. Now, this is far from ideal, and the reason that uh, transducers are extremely expensive is that um, they're characterized very well. There's many different ceramic elements inside of them. Uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of magic to them, a lot of analog engineering, uh, acoustic en engineering, mechanical engineering that a lot of people just don't have a whole lot of experience to do. So what we've decided to do is take this and, and try to take it. It's not ideal. It's far from ideal, but we want to take this and uh, create uh, an analog digital system around it that, that, can take, uh, that can alleviate some of the disadvantages of this. And uh, that's what we're building with this CSR, CSR funding. So I've learned a lot. Um, one of the, the things that I really learned is that this is um, a difficult problem. There's not a lot of information about it. Um, transducer design, analog design, for the most part, is, is in some form black, black magic. Um, and it's hard to find the design secrets for this. Um, there are a lot of reasons why not that many people make acoustic modems. It's not an easy thing, uh, especially in academic setting. And uh, the modem completion is always six months away. So we have been close to completing this modem for six months for a long time. 
So we have some tests uh, going on in a, a month or two off of Scripps Piers with some boats and some buoys and some moorings. Um, we're lo looking at, uh, we need to keep this low power because we want to be able to keep this deployed for six to nine months, basically on the same scale as the uh, sensors that are being deployed. Um, and the way to do that is low power wake up circuitry. Um, we're looking into ways that we can automatically uh, vary the bit rate and the power uh, based on the conditions. So if um, the conditions are bad, we can up the power. If they're good, we can lower the power. If we don't need a whole lot of uh, uh, data to send, we can lower the bit rate, these kind of things. So adaptive modulation based on, on the environment. Uh, and we plan to have this uh, modem design finished in six months. Uh, there are a lot of people that have uh, done a lot of work on this. It's, uh, it seems like a somewhat simple project, but it covers a huge amount of areas from mechanical engineering to electrical engineering, computer science, computer engineering. Um, and we've you know, worked with a bunch of these people. So uh, I get to come and talk about these kind of things and say, look at all this, this cool work, uh, but these are the people that really did all the work. Uh, and we've been able to get a decent amount of uh, funding from uh, a number of different sources, so I just wanted to acknowledge that, including uh, CalIT and the CSRO funding. Thank you.